Despite his rough appearance, Ernst Röhm has a shrewd mind and unmatched skills as a political organizer. He sees himself as a pure military man. Since I am a wicked and immature man, war and unrest appeal to me more than the orderly life of your respectable citizen. Röhm is the first of two important allies that will join Adolf Hitler in expanding the newly renamed National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP, or Nazis for short, into a formidable force, not just in their home base of Munich, but across all of Deutschland. Despite initial skepticism about the potential of the fledgling German Workers' Party, Adolf Hitler had quickly recognized the opportunity for power and worked tirelessly to build the party's supporter base and influence. Using bold tactics, such as paid advertisements in an era where most groups to the extreme left and right hid in the shadows, and organizing large meetings that required payment upon entry, he was able to significantly increase membership of the DAP. In February 1920, he unveiled a powerful manifesto at the party's largest ever meeting at the Hofbrauhaus in Munich, an event that marked Hitler's successful entry into mass politics. It is during this period that Hitler crosses paths with two individuals crucial to the young party's growth. Ernst Röhm, who has replaced Karl Mayer as the commander of the Army Abteilung, to which Hitler is still officially attached, is a formidable figure. He is short and bulky, with a face that bears the hallmarks of the war in which he served as a frontline officer on the Western Front. It is scarred a deep red by an explosion at Verdun. His nose has been reduced to a tiny point by a bullet, and his cheek has been slashed with a long bayonet scar. He has been cut off from what he deems an orderly life by his own rampant homosexuality. Röhm has been assigned the post-war task of organizing the Black Reichswehr in Bavaria. His job is to channel army funds and support to paramilitary and right-wing groups that could serve as reserves to the army in troubled times. As a former adjutant to Franz Ritter von Epp, Rome is the key link between right-wing paramilitary and Freikorps formations and the regular army. It is Rome who decides which groups will receive lavish financial support and the large caches of arms and ammunition that are being stockpiled in secret, away from the prying eyes of leftists and allied disarmament commissions. After meeting Hitler at a gathering of the Iron Fist, a right-wing paramilitary group, Röhm immediately decides that Hitler is the man for Germany and sets about supporting him, both with money and by channeling new recruits into the NSDAP directly from the army. These war veterans form the core of a new Nazi private army, keeping order at meetings and dealing with hostile hecklers by fist, boot, and whatever else is at their disposal. The second influential figure Hitler meets around this time is the Bavarian poet and dramatist Dietrich Eckhart, who will soon become an enormous help to Hitler in these early days. Like Kurt Eisner, the revolutionary president of the People's State of Bavaria, Eckhart is a Munich cafe intellectual, but with politics of the extreme right. His local publication, Auf gut Deutsch, in good German, is a rabidly anti-Jewish paper. Eckhart, already middle-aged and slowly dying of disease and a potential cocaine addiction, is a respected and talented writer who moves easily in Bavarian high society. Hitler, with his bohemian inclinations, finds himself captivated by the vibrant personality of Eckhart. Pouring a substantial portion of his wealth into the budding movement, Eckhart becomes an invaluable mentor for the somewhat awkward Hitler. He not only contributes financially, but also assists Hitler in refining his social graces, smoothing out his rough army manners, and introducing him into the moneyed world of Munich's social elite. It is with these two influential figures at his side that Hitler will continue to grow the Nazi party into a faction that cannot be ignored and will not be denied. 
Darkness Over Deutschland will return after this short break. In Munich, Adolf Hitler works with Röhm and Eckhart to build the Nazi party into a force to be reckoned with. In Berlin, Wolfgang Kapp, a German nationalist and political activist, and Walter von Lutwitz, a German general who fought in World War I, launch a coup to overthrow the Weimar Republic. The Kapp Lutwitz Putsch, as it will come to be known, is driven by a fierce resentment of the Treaty of Versailles and economic instability. The leaders of the Putsch seek to establish a government that will annul the Treaty of Versailles and restore what they perceive to be Germany's former glory. On March 13, 1920, Kapp and Lutwitz declare the establishment of a new government in Berlin with support from elements within the German army, the Freikorps, a paramilitary group composed of ex-soldiers, and conservative political factions. The government of the Weimar Republic, led by Chancellor Gustav Bauer, flees to Stuttgart. Amid the chaos of the Kap Lutwitz Putsch, Dietrich Eckhart and Adolf Hitler travel to Berlin on an important liaison mission aimed at establishing contact with Kap. Their mode of travel is a light plane piloted by Ritter von Grimm, a seasoned ace from the Great War who will later become the final head of the Luftwaffe. This airborne journey marks a significant milestone for Hitler. It is the first ever flight for the future Führer. The plane makes an emergency landing in communist-held territory where Hitler and Eckhart barely escape shooting. They eventually arrive in the capital, only to discover Cap has already fled and the putsch is on the verge of collapse. They are horrified to discover the chancellery occupied only by Cap's shady PR man, the Hungarian-born Jew Trebich Lincoln. Taking Hitler's arm, Eckhart suggests a retreat, whispering, Come on, Adolf, this is no place for us. The pair stays on in Berlin, where Eckhart introduces Hitler to the strongest nationalist organization in the North, the Stahlhelm, and to his friend Frau Helena Beckstein, wife of the famous piano manufacturer. She is the first of many wealthy women to fall under Hitler's spell and contributes much needed financial support to his movement. Once he has returned to Munich, Hitler decides it is finally time to devote himself heart and soul to the party and to his own mission. With this end in mind, he takes the decisive step of finally resigning from the army. Hitler spends the rest of 1920 organizing and building up the NSDAP. He believes the party needs its own distinctive emblem, and in a move that will leave its mark forever on the 20th century, he decides to appropriate the swastika emblem, already used previously in Germany by the Thule Society and by some Freikorps and other nationalist factions, such as the Erhardt Brigade. To put the party's own unique spin on the symbol, Hitler reverses the direction of the arms of the swastika and combines it with a white circle and a red background to create the infamous official party flag. Dietrich Eckhart then provides the party with its official slogan, Deutschland erwache, Germany awake, and awaken, it will. If you have enjoyed this podcast episode of Darkness Over Deutschland, please make sure to check out the other episodes in the series via the playlist on screen. Thank you for listening to the Darkness Over Deutschland podcast.